The title of this lecture is That All May Be One. And we have dealt in the last few lectures with the political aspects, and tonight I want to start with the religious aspects. The Vatican II meetings. Vatican II, the Pope is being carried in during that meeting, and at that meeting it was decided that the churches, the Protestant churches, may remain in their confessions and obtain salvation, provided, of course, that they accept and acknowledge the supremacy of the Bishop of Rome. Now, after Vatican II, it was Karl Rahner, the Jesuit. Strange how they keep popping up. I know I'm saying this frequently, but it's just a fact. He was the one who was commissioned to take this message to the world that everyone could remain in their confession provided they acknowledged the supremacy of the Bishop of Rome. And I've already dealt with this, but I'm going to go into a little bit more detail now. Uh, Paul Netter, who was, uh, held a position at Xavier uh, University, Cincinnati, where he's professor of theology, he studied under Karl Rahner, and he wrote this book, No Other Names. And in this book, no other name, he writes certain interesting things. He has a commentary on it. It's interesting that they have uh, this little uh, humanist man over there on the book. Tells us it's humanism. He write, faces the conundrum of what the committed Christian believer does theologically in the face of growing evidence, scholarly and from personal encounter, that there are other ways, religious ways, of leading a full authentic human life than the Christian way. Are you beginning to see something? Can a person be saved? Definition. That is, come to live a truly human life by some other name than that of Jesus Christ. Hello, let me just recap there. To be saved means to live a truly human life. Is that correct theology? This is a professor of theology, and this book is prescribed in virtually all seminaries of theology in the entire world. Nitter's answer is, one can be saved by some other name. And then he proceeds to show how this affirmation can be squared theologically with full Christian commitment. This is first-rate creative theology. That's the only sentence I agree with. It is creative theology, but it's definitely not biblical theology. Well, at the Second Ecumenical Council, if the Bible is not going to be the norm, we'll have to replace it with something else. And it was decided in document 515, of page 515 of the ecumenical doc documents that were written at Vatican II documents, the unity of all Christians may at last be restored to shine forth for all peoples are called to be a single new people confessing one Jesus, Savior and Lord, professing one faith, celebrating one Eucharistic mystery. There are lots of problems with there in this particular one, particularly the Eucharistic mystery. All Christians should be of an ecumenical mind. Document Vatican II, page 515. The Catholic Catechism will tell us that Vatican II did not change the doctrines. It only appeared to change the doctrines. This is the present catechism of the Catholic Church, Article 816. The sole Church of Christ, which our Savior after his resurrection entrusted to Peter's pastoral care, commissioning him and other apostles to extend his rule, this Church, constituted and organized as a society in the present world, subsists in the Catholic Church. The Second Vatican Council decree on ecumenism explains, for it is through Christ's Catholic Church alone, which is the universal help towards salvation, that the fullness of the means of salvation can be obtained. There's been no change in doctrine. Only Protestants believe that there has been a change of doctrine. Wounds of Unity, Article 817. Where there are sins, there are also divisions, schisms, and heresies. So, if there was a division, then it was sin. So who's the sinner? The one who separated. Towards unity. Christ bestowed unity on his church from the beginning. And uh, this is something the church can never lose. 820. It didn't change. 
It still governs the rules, the church, through its supreme pontiff and bishops. Everybody will have to acknowledge this. This is why priest J. O'Connell says, the final object of ecumenism as Catholics conceive it is unity in the faith, worship, and the acknowledgement of the supreme spiritual authority of the Bishop of Rome. That's the bottom line. The church bond of non-Christian religions, all nations form but one community. They want the same relations with Muslims, with all the other religions. Let's make sure that this is true. This was the catechism, it can't be wrong. Further questions answered, Bonaventure Hinwood. Vatican II teaches in several places that the Catholic Church and it alone is the church founded by Jesus Christ. No change in the Vatican II documentation. Then September 5, 2000, uh, the Vatican made this quite clear. The church has examined the Vatican statement. 36-page statement said other Christian communities, such as Anglicans and other Protestants, are not churches in the proper sense. Canon David Oliver, minister of St. Thomas Anglican Church, says, oh, well, it's, just, oh, it's okay, whatever. Other churches are not sis no sisters of ours, the Vatican insists. And remember that Karl Rahner said, it must always be clear that the one holy Catholic and apostolic universal church is not the sister, but the mother of all the churches. So that's the latest statement, definitive statement, from the highest sources in the Vatican. Vatican II changed nothing. These are some of the comments of the other churches. Churches are stunned by Pope's attack. Protestant churches expressed disappointment, etc. But nothing changed. They were still in the ecumenical movement. The Washington Post has said, a new Vatican dictum issued today declares that individuals can ta obtain full salvation from earthly sin only through the spiritual grace of the Catholic Church. There you go. And that other faiths, including Protestant Christian ones, have defects that place their followers in gravely deficient situations. And that includes Muslims, Hindus, Jews, everyone. They have to accept Catholicism as leader. That's what the Vatican teaches. Now, how are you going to do this if the Bible so clearly condemns Catholicism? Well, Vatican and the Sunday, again, the documents, Vatican II, any endeavor must be made to make Sunday a genuine day of joy and worship. We must celebrate the Paschal mystery. It must be the primordial feast day. There must be freedom from work. Shall not have precedence over Sunday. All feasts are important. Then it says the supreme manifestation of this is the Sunday assembly. So again, Vatican II reiterated that Sunday was the day that was to be kept. And they call it the Lord's Day. And in their catechism, Article 2174, they admit that we all gather on the day of the sun, for it is the first day after the Jewish Sabbath. There's no such thing as a Jewish Sabbath. The Sabbath was instituted in Eden long before there was a Jew. Now, Sunday, in Christ's Passover, Sunday fulfills the spiritual truth of the Jewish Sabbath and announces man eternal rest from God. And it comes from tradition. This all stands in their catechism. I'm not going to go into the detail. So now, if you're not going to have the Bible as basis, then you better give the people something else. Musical celebration. This is page 83. Vatican documents actively participate more willingly. Uh, format of the celebration and degree of participation should be varied as much as possible. The liturgy. Now, the liturgy is everything that happens in a church beside the sermon. It marvelously increases the church's power to preach Christ. So now... Let's put more emphasis on the liturgy and less emphasis on the what? The preaching. And they even call it in some documents the holy liturgy. A sign lifted up amongst the nations and to gather the children that are scattered until there is one fold, one shepherd. Of course, that has to be the Pope. How are we going to do this? This is Vatican II, their documentation, document Vatican II, quote, in all popular devotions, the psalms will be especially useful and also works of sacred music drawn from both old and more recent heritage of sacred music, popular religious songs, organ, other instruments, characteristics of a particular people. The participation and celebration should be internal but must also be external. Internal 
participation by gestures and bodily attitudes, acclamations, responses, and singing. In other words, Vatican II says, let's make the service lively. Let's start moving, let's have some bodily attitudes, let's shake the arms, you know, then it's not so important whether you have your Bible. In fact, it's hard to hold the Bible if your arms are swinging around like cartwheels. How must the songs be? Let's go again to the Catechism. Article 1157, song and music fulfill their function as signs in a manner all the more significant. That's fine, there's nothing wrong with singing. Singing must be beautiful and to the glory of God. But they say the music must be emotional. Quote, Vatican Catechism, how I wept, deeply moved by your hymns, songs and voices that echoed through your church, what emotion I experienced, sounds that flowed in my ears, distilling the truth in my heart, a feeling of devotion surged within me, tears streaming down my face, tears that did me good. So the more tears and the more emotion, the better. Switch the mind off and switch on something else. And so the papacy started using rock groups and the Pope started singing to ABBA music and all this sort of stuff started coming into the churches, which was unknown before. This is the Pope's personal little rock band that goes with him sometimes when he travels. These days they've advanced to the more metal groups and all of those. And by 1967, the uh, faculty and students of the Catholic Dequesme University started becoming charismatic. By 1968, the World Council of Churches uh, had uh, Catholics as observers. By 1975, there were observers in Nairobi. By 1975, a mass, mass gathering took place at Rome, and Pope Paul II actually started speaking in tongues. Here it is, Christianity Today, June 6, 1975. Bishops, archbishops, cardinals struggling to keep their hats in place, sang and danced in ecstasy, embracing one another, raising their arms to heaven, and Pope Paul VI's address was punctuated with ecstatics. So he started speaking in tongues. Great example for the church. The Lutheran Church, by 1974, the U.S. Lat Lutheran Roman Catholic Dialogue, published Papal Primacy and the Universal Church. They were beginning to play with the idea that Rome would again be the head of the churches. The Presbyterians, Congregationalists, Methodists followed. Colin Buchanan writes, the emergence of the Church of Rome as a partner in ecumenical discussions and the impact of the charismatic movement totally changed the ecumenical relationship. So, this new spirit makes the talk between the various opposing factions more and more possible. By 1975, there was a common catechism where the moral directives in the Decalogue were questions, where many passengers in the New Testament were put in the mouth of Jesus, things that the historical Jesus never uttered, the physical resurrection is a problem full of difficulties, etc., etc., starting to question the Bible. By 1977, there was a joint Roman Catholic Commission which issued, together with the Anglican Church, this statement. It seems appropriate that in any future union, universal primacy, such as has been described, shall be held by the Roman See. So the Anglican Church said, okay, Pope shall be head. By 1989, the Anglican Archbishop of Canterbury, the Reverend Robert Runcie, went to Rome and urged Christians to consider the primacy of the Pope. Better together. There they are. And then came the fam famous signing of the document, where they actually signed. There is the signing. The Pope and Runcie signed the declaration at Canterbury, and the Pope is now the head of these churches. And some nice Masonic signals. Yes, they're going to be together. And the Queen, well, she and her entourage visit the Pope and say, well, what did um, Prince Charles say? I do not want to longer be the protector of the faith, but just protector of faith. So Protestantism goes. And of course, much marching in the, in the streets of the United Kingdom. The next um, uh, Archbishop of Canterbury is Carey. And Carey is remarkable because of his charismatic renewal and speaking in tongues. So, 
the Anglican Church the first to go Romeward bound. Now, this is the famous St. Paul's Cathedral. There it is, London bus. I photographed this myself. And this is a stunning picture. What do you see? What does it look like? It looks like a miniature of the Vatican. Yes, in fact, it is a replica of the Vatican. And the very amazing thing is that uh, St. Paul's Cathedral never looked like that. Never looked like that. In fact, it used to look like that. But now, it has been totally rebuilt, and it now looks like that. Uh, doesn't this sound remarkably like an image of the beast? An image of the beast? Well, let's go inside. You have to be very sneaky with your camera when you go in there. And this is what it looks like now. There's the main altar. Wow, the main altar is an exact copy of Benini's canopy in Rome. That means the Protestant church here has copied Rome. Very interesting. There are the black and white squares. They have cupids with other angelic beings, male, females, etc. And if you look at the ceiling and you photograph the top, you will find beautiful Masonic symbols. This is masonry. This is not Church of England. So the Church of England has capitulated and has become part of masonry. And therefore we could say... Luciferian. Sad, but true. Well, in front of the main altar you have the typical solar symbols. Looking from the top, it's like a witch's cove. It's been restructured. This is occultism. In fact, it even has the black and white pentagram on the floor. And on the floor it has the symbol of the serpent with a tail in the mouth representing the sun and the moon. By the way, those are my shoes. They were nice and clean. And the solar deities on the floor. So this is nothing other than Catholicism. Here are symbols of uh, New Age. These are the peacock, symbols of Lucifer, the triangles in the, in the circle, uh, the hexagrams, and of course the corpses under the altar, and IHS on their, and sun blazes on their utilities. Also the mythical pelican or bird feeding its young to its flesh. These are occult symbols. No wonder Pope John Paul II could write in Crossing the Threshold of Hope that by the year 2000 we need to be more united. For unity all churches must accept papal authority, the Pope said in 1995. That's the condition of unity. Now why did the Reformation split from Rome? Surely the Reformation had good reasons, biblical reasons. Revelation 13 verse 8 said, And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundations of the world. Well, they have surely corrupted that one in the modern translations, but never mind, that's what it says. They shall not be written in the book of life if they worship the system by obeying it. Here is the Dom zu Berlin. This is the Lutheran mother church, if you like, in Germany. And there they have huge pictures of Mary with candles burning in front of it. There you have it. This is back to Rome. And the Weltbild published the picture of Martin Luther shaking hands with the Pope. Well, in the 1980s, the Pope went to Mainz, Germany, and he said, Ecumenism is an urgent task. And then Christians forging towards a new era, churches have a pact. And then the famous synod in Germany, the Lutheran synod, Heise Eisen, Alte Zöpfe, these old bones of contention, if you like, and they decided, Der Papst soll nicht mehr Antichrist genannt werden. The Pope will no longer be called Antichrist. Well, that's the end of the Reformation as far as Lutheran is concerned. Time magazine uh, then picked it up and said, a half millennium rift. Lutherans and Catholics reach agreement on the issues that once split Western Christianity in two. And by 1999, November 1st, churches end 500-year rift. So the Lutherans acknowledged the Pope. And this amazing statement Germany calls to ask, forgive Luther. For what? 
For what should he be forgiven? And the Calvinistic church, they said, we need to have more respect for the icons and the things. We cannot just uh, go together like this. Luther leader says Pope might be global spokesperson for all Christians. Friday Church News Notes, July 6, 2001. Ishmael Noko, General Secretary of the Lutheran World Fellowship, said in March that Lutherans can certainly look to the Pope as one of the spiritual leaders in the world today. He went on to say that the ecumenical movement requires Christians to look into the possibility that the Pope should become the global spokesperson for all Christians. So, the Anglicans capitulate, the Lutherans capitulate, the Presbyterians capitulate, the Methodists capitulate, everybody capitulates. In Germany you have now churches such as this one, which I find interesting. There's the Catholic side, there's the Protestant side, and they share the bell tower. And... By the year 2000, the uh, Knights of Columbus, which of course is Jesuit controlled, started sending icons of Our Lady of Guadalupe to all the churches in the world. Nativity of the Blessed Virgin, it's wonderful, says Gino Massotti, Grand Knight of the Knights Columbus Council 11606 at the Precious Blood Cathedral that he hopes everybody bows down to the icon. Then came the Joint Declaration of Lutherans and Catholics, where they discussed the doctrine of justification, a brilliantly written document, which totally undermines the Protestant principle. Well, if the Bible goes, you better get livelier, so that the people don't read the Bible so much. Theologen wollen lebendiger werden. Theologians want to become livelier. Let's go to church to have, you know, some liturgy, some movement. I don't know, you know, you swing your arms, maybe you can switch the air conditioners off, I don't know what the aim of it all is, but churches forge together. Recent years, many leaders of national churches have moved from a no comment to the view that the charismatic movement is the best hope of renewal. Professor Hollenberger said exactly the same thing. He said Catholics, Protestants come together because of the charismatic movement which has worked miracles. Charismatic wave of unity amongst SA churches. Then the Dutch Reformed Church says the time is more than ripe to look at what we have in common and not what separates us. And all these great people say exactly the same thing, the moderators of all these great churches. By 1990s, the World Council of Churches was not the same as it used to be. Originally, the World Council of Churches was there to talk about Protestant unity, but of course it had an agenda to be led towards Rome. Why is Rome not a member of the ecumenical movement? Because it never separated. It's the mother. It's the, the, the kiddies that might come together to go back to mommy. That's what's got to happen. If Rome became a member of the ecumenical movement, she would say that she's one of the sisters. She's not. She's the mother. So she cannot be. And at the World Council of Churches, they said here, come Holy Spirit, renew the whole creation was the overall theme. Now, the lady who was in charge of the main speech in the beginning was Miss Chung Chung, as she burns a list of the dead she invoked. Well, she gave the address. She is now a professor at UTS. And she uh, arrived on the stage dancing with Aboriginal men in loincloths and etc. And then... Uh, she invoked the dead. She called up Hagar, Uriah, the male babies killed by Herod, Joan of Arc, people killed in the gas chambers, Mahatma Gandhi, Steve Biko, Martin Luther King, and finally she also called up the spirit of our liberator, Jesus Christ. Very nice. And then she burnt the list as a symbol. Now let's look at what happens here. Combining verbal fireworks with a performance by Korean and Aboriginal dancers, Chung rendered a dramatic evocation of a female Holy Spirit. She linked it to Hagar, exploited and abandoned by Abraham and Sarah. I also know that I no longer believe in an omnipotent macho warrior God who rescues all good guys and punishes all bad guys. Eighteen times Chung summoned the spirit of the dead, who have suffered injustices and claim that without hearing the cries of these spirits, we cannot hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. Don't bother the spirit by calling her all the time. Added Chung, 
I hope the presence of all our ancestor spirits here with us shall not make you uncomfortable. Well, is this uh, biblical, yes or no? Definitely not. But she is the minister of the biggest Protestant church in Korea, and she is now also professor at UTS. Chung Kyung Hyung Kyung was a graduate of the Union Theological Seminary, which I've already told you is Masonic. Chung was professor of Korea's Ewa Women's University, the world's largest university for women with 20,000 students. She said, the three goddesses I want to share with you are Kali, Hindu, Kwan In, Buddhist, and Ena, Philippines. My new trinity. Interesting. She added, the Christian church has been very patriarchal. That's why we are here together in order to destroy this patriarchal idolatry of Christianity. Okay, so that's the main spokesman at most of the World Council of Churches meetings. She explains, I came from shamanist Buddhist and Confucius and Taoist and Christian tradition. When I look at our history of religion, we have more than 5,000 years of shamanism, more than 2,000 years of Taoism, almost 2,000 years of Buddhism, 700 years of Confucianism, and only 100 years of Protestantism in Korea. Therefore, whenever I go to the temples, I look to Buddha, I feel so young. Buddha died in his, in his 80s, Jesus died when he was 33. Maybe Jesus should be called too young to understand. Wow, I feel like my bow, my bow is shamanist, my heart is Buddhist, my right brain is Confucianist, and my left brain is Christian, Kyung continued. I call it a family of gods, and they are together. So do you see the direction in which the World Council of Churches is moving? Uh, Kyung also said, we believe that this life-giving energy came from God and is everywhere. It is in the sun, in the... Oh, here we go again, how nauseating. What is this? Pantheism. It is from the ground and it isn't from the trees. If you feel very tired and you feel you don't have any energy... To give, what do you do? Sit in silence. Maybe you go to a big tree and ask, give me some of your life energy. Or you ask the sun to give you some life energy. Well, is this Christianity, yes or no? No, this is absolutely not Christianity. Kyung was also a speaker at the World Council of Churches in Harare, Zimbabwe, in November 1998, where she performed the sensual dance. Dr. Kyung declared that to witness about Jesus Christ to another person is in reality an act of violence. Now let's get to the hub of the matter. To witness about Jesus Christ is an act of violence. Why? Because you are doing what? You are going against the human rights of the other individual who might be a Buddhist or a Hindu or this or that. He has the right to be what he is. And if you tell him something else that you have to believe in Jesus Christ, then you are committing an act of violence. So, in other words, what I'm doing is an act of violence. Okay. When reminded that Jesus said in John 14, 6 that he is the only way, Kyung said Jesus was mistaken. Okay. That's why the World Council of Churches uses demons and all kinds of interesting things. And we have oikomene. Oikomene. Now what does oikomene mean? Here we have an example of oikomene. Well, let's ask the World Council of Churches webpage what oikomene actually means. The word ecumenical is derived from the Greek term, term oikomene, which may be translated as the whole inhabited world. It is in seeing this world as gods that we see ourselves as one. It is in seeing all the world's people as made in God's image that we are called to protect the welfare of everyone. Interesting. Now remember that I always show you that Gary Carr said the ancient Babylonian religion through capitalism, etc., through to Freemasonry, controls Marxism, the American secret political sciences, the international banking, and the World Council of Churches. Do you think he might have been right with their teaching? Jesus was wrong, he wasn't young, he was too young to understand. We have nature worship, all of these things. That is definitely not biblical. What does Alice A. Bailey, the founders of Lucifer Trust, predict in 1919? 
she predicted the appearance of a universal church of which the definitive outline will appear towards the end of the century. There will not be any dissociation between the universal church, the sacred lodge of all true masons, see how they're bringing it together, and the inner circle of the esoteric societies. In this way, the goals and work of the United Nations will be solidified and a new church of God, led by all the religions and by all of the spiritual groups, shall put an end to the great heresy of separateness. Good, this requires a whole lecture. This is heavy stuff. So there's a lecture coming, the UN and the occult agenda. It's on your paper. This is very heavy. She says the churches, the lodges, sacred lodge, by the way, and the esoteric societies, by the end of the century, will work together to bring about this new world religion. Now, as a Christian, believing that Jesus is the only way, can I join the society, yes or no? You're all so adamant. This is very strange. Norman Vincent Peale. Now, who is Norman Vincent Peale? Probably one of the greatest preachers of our, t of our times. 33 degree Freemason. Freemasonry has always welcomed men of all faiths and religious beliefs to enter its doors. The only requirement is for good men to believe in the supreme architect and the immortality of the soul, none of which is, of course, biblical. Masons, in fact, go beyond the narrow sectarianism of limiting dogma. They agree with the statement of the famous statesman and writer Edmund Burke, the body of all true religion consists, to be sure, in obedience to the will of the sovereign of the world, in a confidence in his declarations and in imitation of his perfection. That's what Norman Vincent Peale said, who was a 33-degree Freemason. As is Bishop Carl Saunders, 33-degree Freemason, United Methodist Church, Rabbi Seymour Atlas, Dr. James Wesbury, Executive Director and Editor of the Sunday Georgia Baptist Journal, is a 32-degree Freemason, Reverend Louis Grant, District Superintendent, United Methodist Church, 33-degree Freemason, Reverend blah, 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 on and on and on and on. Well, Norman Vincent Peale said, I have found the Scottish Rite and the Symbolic Lodge espouse the belief of no one religion but are a respect of all major religions of the world. And Billy Graham says that Norman Vincent Peale is his great mentor. Interesting. He has a 33 degree mentor. Billy Graham, the world's most popular Christian evangelist, is, was listed on web pages as a 33 degree Freemason by themselves. After much criticism, they took them off all the lists. Shaw, who was himself a 33-degree Freemason, revealed that Billy Graham was at his initiation ceremony. But in his book, The Deception, he talks about a prominent evangelist who attended it so that he could get his book published. Norman Vincent Peale is a definite 33-degree Freemason, ex-grand chaplain of the Grand Lodge of, of New York. This is the one that Billy Graham said is his mentor. Robert Schuller, 33-degree Freemason. These are webpage sites where you can look it up. Uh, but of course, there are many, many writings which confirm this, so this is not the only source. I'm just quoting from the sources. Oral Roberts, Jesse Jackson, uh, most of the early founding Mormons, we know that. Jehovah's Witness, we know all that. Peel. Let's have a look at Norman Vincent Peale. Endorsed the channeled messages called the Jesus Letters, written by Jane Palzera and Annie Brown. So he endorsed channeled letters. The amazing holy letters were written one each day over a two-year uh, period that began on a morning in 1978. She said the letters were dictated by a non-living spirit who identified himself through her pen as Jesus Christ. There's the quote. Peale's response, he adds... It little matters if these writings came from Jesus of Nazareth or Jesus of Jane. They are all the same consciousness, and that consciousness is God. I am part of God, and Jane and Anna are part of that same God. Right, that's what Norman Vincent Peale taught. This is the mentor of Billy Graham. Interesting. Speaking of occultist Kreskin, all he's doing, says Norman Vincent Peale, is dramatizing what I've been preaching in my writings for years. Another book, The Dead Are Alive, They Can Do and Communicate With Us, was also promoted by Peel. He gushed, a masterpiece. I hope it will be read widely. Okay, 
This is the mentor of Billy Graham. Just remember that. The book's author is Harold Sherman, a psychic and spirit medium who also wrote a companion book, You Live After Death. Pope John Paul visits a Jewish synagogue in, by 1986. 87, he tours uh, the U.S. meets with Protestants and Orthodox. 1889, Russia opens the door to the charismatic movement, and so they're all coming together in one big happy family. The Southern Cross, the Catholic newspaper, writes, Israel's chief rabbi pays a visit to the Pope. The patriarch, of course, of the Orthodox Church and the Pope also meet with much Masonic signaling going on over there. Israel invites the Pope to visit the Holy Land and the Pope uh, honors Schindler's widow. This is the rabbi, Robert Jacobs. Let's hear what he has to say on this issue. And in 1965, Vatican II changed that. Jacobs says the Second Vatican Council marked an historic turnaround for Catholic-Jewish relations. And he says John Paul II has done extraordinary things to show respect for Judaism. He was the first pope to visit a synagogue. No pope in Roman history had ever done, has ever done, what he has done. It gives all Jews a feeling that for the first time in Christian church history, Judaism is appreciated as having its own integrity and is not demeaned. I think it's a tremendous privilege to meet this extraordinary Pope. And then when the Pope visited St. Louis, this is what he had to say. We'll rejoice and blossom. They will blossom with abundant flowers and rejoice with joyful song. That's interesting. Well, here is Alexei, the Russian patriarch, and there he is with uh, Cardinal Cassidy, and they have much more freedom. This is a signal picture, by the way. Ecumene, the Pope and the patriarch together, and we have a revival of Eastern Orthodoxy. Occultism is revived, Asian religions are revived, Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism, Shintoism, Soka Gaya, and Spiritism. In the world, there is a revival of religion and religious fervor and conflict is on the increase. Have you noticed that? Yes. Now why? Because through chaos and conflict, you will bring them together. Make the pain of separation greater than the pain of union. Thesis, antithesis, synthesis is the Hegelian philosophy. Great expectations, the Patriarch of Constantinople says, we will join the churches. Then the opening of the Islamic Cultural Center in Rome, Catholic bishops residing, Pope John Paul greets them. Islam and Catholicism, we've dealt with it in a whole lecture, coming together. The problem is how to bring Judaism, Islam, Christianity all together. These are uh, documents from the Catholic Academy of Trier. Note what they are using over here. What is the symbolism they are using? With all these strange symbols on their documents, same over here, pentagrams, all the religious symbols in a circle, papal seminary. What is this structure here with the mystic towels all around it? What does that mean, the emblem of the centenary of the Catholic Church in Cameroon? Well, these are kalants and mandalas, that they are using, these are symbols of Eastern religions, symbolizing the unity of all the churches. Pope and the Dalai Lama together, and uh, it is interesting that we need to study what the Protestant world has to say on this issue as well. And I would like to show you the great Protestant preachers and what they are actually preaching. Now, Robert Schuller is listed on many, many web pages as a 33-degree Freemason. Well, the proof of the pudding, of course, is always in the eating. He wrote here in the fourth dimension forward, I discover the reality, I discovered the reality of that dynamic dimension in prayer that comes through visualization. Don't try to understand it, just start to enjoy it. It's true, it works. I tried it. 
Now visualization is the way in which you start visualizing something and it becomes part of your fantasy world. They train little kids to do this. This is an occult technique, it's occultism. Here is his famous cathedral, the Crystal Palace. There he is, this great preacher. By the way, he took the plans of this cathedral and he took them to Rome in order to have them blessed by the Pope. That's very interesting that Robert Schuller should take these to the Pope to have them blessed. His son is now obviously taking over the ministry as he gets a little bit older. Robert Schuller quote from Self-Esteem, the New Reformation, he writes, Classical theology has erred in its insistence that theology be God-centered and not man-centered. That's very interesting. That's spoken like a true Freemason. Wouldn't you agree? Yes. On page 153 he writes, One classical role of the pulpit in Protestantism has been to preach sermons. Oh, which imply indoctrination more than education. Within this form of communication, there is an inherent intrinsic inclination to intimidate, manipulate, and hence offend the person's most prized quality of humanness, his dignity. Well, that sounds like Vatican II. Let's move to liturgy. Let's have all these wonderful things other than the preaching of the Word. He writes on page 14, Sin is any act or thought that robs ma myself or another human being of his or her self-esteem. That's interesting because I thought the Bible said sin is transgression of the law. Isn't that right? He writes on page 26, 27, What we need is a theology of salvation that begins and ends with the recognition of every person's hunger for glory. Oh, I thought that justification is something that actually lays man's glory in the dust. That's what I thought. It makes Jesus Christ more and me less. Isn't that what the Bible teaches? He must increase, I must decrease. Wow. Page A68. To be born again means that we must be changed from a negative to a positive self-image from inferiori inferiority to self-esteem, from fear to love, from doubt to trust. Very interesting theology. Page 75. The cross sanctified the ego trip, for the cross protected our Lord's perfect self-esteem from turning into sinful pride. Now that is just plain blasphemy, as far as I'm concerned. Page 135. Christ is the ideal one, for he was self esteem incarnate. I thought he came to show humility. Didn't he? My Bible says he was humble. Jesus never called a person a sinner. Rather, he reserved his rightful rebuke for those who used their religious authority to generate guilt and caused people to lose their ability to taste and enjoy their right to dignity. Interesting. I thought he said, I have not called the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Didn't he say that? So this man is obviously losing some strange document. I don't know which Bible he uses. He says, the church's problem is that it has a God-centered theology for centuries when it needs a man-centered one. We're not bad, merely badly informed about how good we are. Oh, Robert Schuller. That's a fascinating statement. It would be an insult to the integrity of any human being to call him a sinner. I thought when he comes, the Holy Spirit, he will convict us of sin and righteousness and judgment. Jesus knew his worth. His success fed his self-esteem. He suffered the cross just to sanctify his self-esteem. And he bore the cross to sanctify your self-esteem. The cross will sanctify the ego trip. Isn't this pathetic? This man is not a Christian. He's a Mason. 
Now, remember, when I say Mason, I mean high Mason, because the poor low, low, lower grades of Masons know nothing about all of this. High Mason, let me qualify it. Schuler further amplified this latter thought on the Phil Donovan show. Schuler said, Jesus had an ego. He said, I, if I be lifted up, will draw all men unto me. Wow, what an ego trip he was on. That's disgusting. Questioner. This is the questioner to Shula. How could the cross, as you write, sanctify the ego trip and make us proud in the light of passages that say, I hate pride and arrogance, Proverbs 8.13, pride goes before destruction, Proverbs 16.18, the Lord detests all the proud, Proverbs 16.5, do not be proud, Romans 12.16, love does not boast, it is not proud, 1 Corinthians 13.4. In fact, Paul warns Timothy that in the last days men will be lovers of themselves, 2 Timothy 3.2. Good questioner. I like the questioner already. Why should we do anything to encourage people to become lovers of themselves if Paul in fact warned others that would be the state of godlessness in the last days? Shula, I hope you don't preach this because you could do a lot of damage to a lot of beautiful people. If you preach that text, oh man, I sure hope you give it the kind of interpretation that I do. Or I'll tell you, you'll drive them further away and they'll be madder than hell at you and they'll turn the Bible off and they'll switch you off and they'll turn on the rock music and Madonna just because it's in, in the Bible doesn't mean you should preach it. It is, it is so difficult to preach some of those texts and not come across as lacking humility. See how these people turn it around? Robert Schuller, what sets me apart from fundamentalists is that they are trying to convert everybody to believe how they believe. We know the things the major faiths can agree on. We try to focus on those without offending those who, with different viewpoints. There's the quote, USA Today. Shula said, When we know we have been redeemed and we know we are part of God's family, we are ready to dream that great divine dream of building the kingdom of God in the world. Now, the kingdom of God, I thought was not of this world. Didn't you think so as well? Robert Schuller said after his thousands telecast, when he was congratulated by Mother Teresa, she was still alive there, Billy Graham congratulated him, Sir Rita Scott King, Martin Luther, all the living presidents of the United States, as well as Sammy Davis Jr. who was a Satanist. They all congratulated him. What we need is a positive to positivize the words that have only a negative connotation. There's no greater damage that can be done than to refer to the lost sinful condition of man. Let me tell you something. If man doesn't realize that he is in a lost sinful condition, then he will never need a savior and then he will be lost. We don't think anything has been done in the name of Christ that and under the banner of Christianity that has proved more destructive to human personality and hence counterproductive to the evangelism enterprise than the often crude, uncouth, unchristian strategy of attempting to make people aware of their lost and sinful condition. Well, that's disgusting. Well, he goes further than that. Let's have a look at what he really consists of. The most effective mantras employ the M sound. You can get the feel of it by repeating the words I am, I am, many times over. Transcendental meditation, or TM, is not a religion, nor is it necessarily anti-Christian. Wow, you can chant, I am, I am, I am? What do you think about that? Now you're saying, I'm God. Surely you don't mean that, Mr. Schuler, do you? Methodists, Anglicans, all of them come together. They all begin to leave, believe in life after death. Well, here in Self-Esteem, the New Reformation, Robert Schuler writes, to be born again means that we must be changed from a negative to a positive self-image. From inferiority to self-esteem, from fear to love, from doubt to trust. And we can pray, note what Mr. Schuler says, Dr. Schuler, sorry, our Father in heaven, honorable is our name. Emphasis in the original. What is Robert Schuler saying? He's saying he is God. Is this Biblical or is it demonic theology? You tell me. You choose. It's demonic. Who approves of his theology? Who likes his theology? 
There it says, discover your possibilities, Robert Schuller, Positive Inspirational Guidelines. Who endorses it? Dr. Schuller has an amazing ministry, Dr. Billy Graham. Birds of a feather flock together. Who is Billy Graham? Here he is, one of the greatest preachers of our time, Christian Winter. Here he is with Nixon. When you went into this ministry, politics lost one of its potentially greatest practitioners. Remember that Nixon had a Jesuit speechwriter? Do you remember that? We showed you those quotes. And, uh, you know, if everybody loves you in the world, well, it gets kind of scary. Here he is at Madison Square Gardens. Here he is at the U.S. Capitol during the presentation of the Congressional Gold Medal that he received with Al Gore sitting there. On receiving honorary doctrine from the Roman Catholic Belmont College, Billum Graham said, the gospel that founded this college is the same gospel which I preach today. Hello, Billy Graham, I thought you were a Protestant. Why are you preaching Catholicism? And please tell me, why in all your campaigns do you have a team of 800 Catholic nuns and Jesuit priests and all kinds of people like that? And why, after you campaign, do you channel them to the Catholic priests to be incorporated in Catholicism? Why do you do that if you are a Protestant? The Religious News Service reported on January 13, 1981, Pope John Paul was closeted for almost two hours with the Reverend Billy Graham, the world's best-known Protestant evangelist. Religious News Service, there it is, there he is together with him. The Pope is almost an evangelist. And here he is, dressed in black, and the Pope dressed in white, talking together. It was through Billy Graham's intervention that former President Ronald Reagan set up an ambassador to the Vatican against the Constitution of the United States. He has been linking agents from the White House to Rome. Graham wrote, this is his own words, speaking for himself, Reagan was the first American president to appoint a full-time ambassador to the Vatican. Before he made the appointment, he asked my view. I told him I thought it would probably be a good thing, in spite of a number of potential problems concerning the separation of church and state, and wrote an extended confidential letter outlining my reasons. Among other things, I told him, I did not think it necessarily a violation of separation of church and state. For whatever reason, Mr. Reagan went ahead with the plan. Later, my letter was leaked to the press. I caused some consternation among my Baptist friends. Yes, of course he would cause a consternation, but his Baptist friends might not know what he is because it is so well covered up in the world. If you want to read about more about him, read Billy Graham and his friends. Robert Schuller's 1986 Possibilities magazine had Templeton's photo on the cover. The lead article quoted Templeton that nothing exists except God, that is pantheism, and that the Christ spirit dwells in every human being, whether the person knows it or not, that's universalism. Templeton. Now, who received the Templeton Prize? Of course, Billy Graham. Graham told Schuler during an interview, whether they come from the Muslim world, or the Buddhist world, or the Christian world, they are members of the body of Christ because they've been called by God. Yes, you can be a member of the body of Christ in any of those religions if you unknowingly do what the law requires because your conscience dictates this and God overlooks the ignorance of those who do not know. The ignorance God winks at. But if you know the law and you do it not, you will die. If you don't know the law and you still break the law, you will also die. That means eternally. So evangelicals and Catholics join forces eventually and Pope John Paul is decried as the superstar of the world. Pope deserves the title of first citizen of the world. Newsweek said that in 79 already. After September 11, ecumenism received a tremendous boost. All the religions started coming together, the Muslims and the Protestants and the Catholics, they were all praying together. Death of Protestantism foreseen. By 1997, the Episcopal Church, with its bishop here, had the following to say. Bishop Adler, the word of the Lord told us, 
that what we are witnessing is the end of an era that God is restoring his temple and that there would be a priesthood and episcopacy that was an apostolic concession. A main difference between the Protestant faith and Catholicism. Now this is this church. This is the, basically the High Church of England in the United States. Bishop Adler said that after the sermon he stood up to give a prophetic word but fell on the floor and wept for 45 minutes. And then he said, we all sensed what God was saying to us. We were witnessing the end of Protestantism. And then he said, God's church is Catholic. He declared, it was Catholic in the beginning and it will be Catholic in the end. Churches agree, Pope has overall authority. Isn't that interesting? The Pope wrote this and he said in his crossing the threshold of hope that by the year 2000 we will need to be more united. 1999, June, they wrote, the Pope was recognized as the overall authority in the Christian world, in the Christian world entirely, by an Anglican and Roman Catholic commission yesterday which described him as a gift to be received by all the churches. Interesting. And then he has a gift of authority. The 43-page document, the gift of authority, has been produced by the 18-member Anglican Roman Catholic International Commission, and it concluded that the Bishop of Rome had a specific ministry concerning the discernment of truth. What does that mean? That is infallible. So the Protestant world has given up Protestantism. Churches should hold seances. Yes, who said that? This was the Anglican Church in England. Now we're ready for spiritism in the church. The churches are really falling. Falling. These are no longer prophetic words. These are false prophetic words. These are false prophets. They are preaching a lie. And in the next lecture, it will become abundantly clear what is happening. Don't miss the next lecture, Strange Fire. We'll see some videos which will be astounding. So, he said, what, what the Anglican priest said is that we can actually talk to the deceased and uh, maybe we can reach the atheists who died from the other side and convince them now that, you see, the living there, after all, you don't have to be an atheist anymore. If their theology was true, couldn't God do it? The Roman Catholic controversy, James R. White, uh, is a, a writer who says that today, well, are we coming together? There are many reasons why we should say separate. He sees the problems. The Council of Trent said, to check the unbridled spirit, it decrees that no one relying on his own judgment shall in matters of faith and morals pertaining to the edification of Christian doctrine, distorting the Holy Scriptures in accordance with his own conceptions, presume to interpret them contrary to that sense which Holy Mother Church, to whom it belongs to judge of their true sense and interpretation, has held and holds. So only the church may tell you what to believe. You're goyim, you're too stupid to understand it yourself. Interesting. The papacy, has it changed? No. Refinement of evil, where the Pope outlines that every single ancient doctrine held by Rome will be held. Therefore, can I be part of the ecumenical movement, yes or no? I cannot be, because I cannot accept this as my spiritual leader. I have one leader, and his name happens to be Jesus Christ. It's the only leader I have. And I have one creed, and that creed happens to be the Bible, and the Bible alone. That's my creed, otherwise I have no standard whatsoever. Keeper of the straight and narrow, there's Cardinal Ratzinger, German-born Cardinal Josef Ratzinger, head of the Congregation of Doctrine and Faith. They make sure that every ancient Catholic doctrine remains and that no Protestant even recognizes it. They're so sneaky. Here is uh, Cardinal Kung and uh, these people, Hans Kung, all they want to do is bring about ecumenism. So they make lots of Protestant noises. Didn't the Jesuits say that if you want to win someone, make his noises, yes or no? Yes. Don't trust them one little bit. By 1986, we had the Council of Assisi, and all the religions of the world 
were present. That included Islam, Hinduism, all these religions. They all came together at Assisi. There's the Pope, there are the patriarchs, there's Ransi, there's the Dalai Lama, Hinduism, Buddhism, every single thing was present. Where? At Assisi. You know what's interesting? After the Council of Assisi, there came an earthquake and the whole cathedral collapsed. It's almost like God said, Tick. Guess what they did? They instantly rebuilt it to its former glory. Instantly, immediately, it stands as an icon to Assisi. And at this Assisi meeting in 86, the first rot started of accepting the papacy as the ultimate. By 1999, this is what happened. The United Nations of Faith moved mountains. Article appeared in the Belgian national newspaper, Le Serre, dated 30th August 2000. A general rehearsal is taking place at the highest level in the forum where the supreme being grand architect, that's Masonic language, or watchmaker of the universe, if he exists at all, they're derogatory, is to recognize his own at a time when the United Nations will shortly host the summit of the millennium with the presence of the heads of state of the entire world. All the world's religious leaders have been gathering in New York. How much of the world's religious leaders? All. All. To discuss the most important theme of world peace and tolerance. The more distant objective to create a kind of United Nations of Faith, where the representatives of faith and philosophies could meet in an order to discuss the future together while abandoning their fatwas, thesis, and other terrible arms of excommunication and exclusion and relegating them to the cloakroom. Let's get away from our separateness. Let's come together. This is a very noble ecumenical initiative sponsored by whom? Ted Turner, a 33-degree Freemason who hates Christianity, who funded the initiative. He is vice president of Time Warmer, founder of CNN, and for every sin there is grace, ten years ago, the flamboyant boss of instantaneous television had declared that Christianity was nothing but an affair for losers and freaks. Okay, so he still believes it. Now why would Ted Turner finance something like that? Because he says Jane Fonda, his wife, turned Christian and that changed his mind? I don't think so. I think it's because he's a 33 degree Freemason and they have an agenda. Well, 2,000 representatives of very well or less known religions, the one which are participated the world over, which are almost an affair of confidence, only known in the corridors of the UN, or the Spiffling Waldorf Astoria Hotel, which will be used for the subsequent meetings and work. The Pope sent the African Cardinal Francis Arsene, President of the Pontifical Council for Interfaith Dialogue, Representing the Jewish faith was the Jewish rabbi, Lao of Jerusalem. The Buddhists were deprived of the presence of the Dalai Lama. This shows that the religion is never far removed from politics. China threatened to boycott the meeting if he went. That's just a game they're playing. Well, the initiative, Bishop Desmond Tutu said, let's go ahead with it. And in the US, and in particular in circles of the UN, this first initiative has been very welcome. Nevertheless, one needs to render to Caesar, or rather, to John Paul II, his Jews. It is indeed thanks to him that the way of reconciliation was started at Assisi in 1985, culminating in that meeting in 1986. Well, the Pope then, May 2001, visited the famous mosque in Damascus. John Paul II made history by becoming the first ever pontiff to enter a mosque and urging Christians and Muslims to forgive each other. That's the mosque, remember, I showed it to you, the famous mosque in uh, Damascus, and we walked through it and uh, had a look at this amazing structure with these people having the same rituals as in Roman Catholicism. And you will remember that we spoke about the head of John the Baptist that is stored in this mosque. So it's significant that the Pope went to that particular mosque to go and seek reconciliation. 
although reconciliation is just a word for the goyim, the outside, the inside has always been reconciled. And we know already that the Pope then kissed the Quran. So the initiative is to bring all the religions, this is a, a symbol of the religions dancing together, a symbol of uh, Judaism and Buddhism and Christianity and Hinduism and all of them coming together in a one great big happy family. Uh, this is the title page of Rotarian Bishop Lehmann's document, The World Peace Day and the Emblem of the World Conference of Religions. Hinduism, Buddhism, and finally we have a parliament of world religions. Now this parliament of world religions is an outcome of the Assisi meeting. And this was their Africa Day. They have the sun symbol in the middle. There are interesting symbols in this. So at this interfaith meeting in 1999, as a reported Associated Press with the Dalai Lama sitting by his right side, October 1999, there was another meeting. Uh, in Rome, the Pope presided at a special council of some 2,000 religious leaders of various faith, sects, and cults. Now I'm going to show you a video of that in a moment of what happened there. The pontiff told the assembled Buddhist monks, Zoroastrian priests, Catholic cardinals, Hindu gurus, American Indian shaman, Jewish rabbis, and ecumenical clergy, that's all the Protestants that there are, that all must join in condemning who? The Christian fundamentalists. Wow! I thought the problems were elsewhere. But he obviously has an inside tack, so he knows who the real problem people are. It's the Christian fundamentalists. Why? Because they commit the ultimate crime of telling people about who? Jesus. Don't you think there's a total onslaught on Jesus Christ? I believe there is. Christian fundamentalists who abuse speech and whose efforts at converting others incite hatred and violence. Didn't uh, Miss Kung say the same thing? Yes or no? She said the same thing at the World Council of Churches. So we want a unity, but please let this unity be on a universal Christ. Just leave Jesus out of this. This is an attack on Jesus Christ. All present were in accord on two key points. Number one, Pope John Paul II was endorsed by consensus as the planet's chief spiritual guide and overseer. That's interesting. And number two, religious fundamentalists who refused to go along with the global ecumenical movement, that would include me, for example, are to be silenced. So who knows how many times you can still hear this message. They must be denounced as dangerous extremists full of hate. That's why we have hate laws. You're not supposed to preach this message. You're not supposed to preach that Jesus Christ is Lord. Then you are a dangerous extremist full of hate. Well, I figured I better preach it before we can no longer preach it. And that's why I'm here, to tell you about these things. The onslaught is not against me, the onslaught is against the Lord. And he predicted that this was going to happen. Well, let's have a look at this Masonic meeting. You will see three candles in this meeting. That's Masonic. They light the solar candles, which are little covered candles, which are used in Hinduism, for example, as solar candles, and in Buddhism and Eastern mysticism. And you will see that they use all kinds of music, just like the Bible said. In fact, the main rock band of Italy gave the background music at the ceremony on the one stage, with the papacy on the other stage, and every religious leader of note in the world was there, of every religion, to bow down and give homage to the Pope. Interesting. Let's watch it. Padre di tutti noi, intese quei mari, per abbracciare gente nobiltà, di tutte le tribù, del popolo di Dio.
looks so smug, doesn't it? Well, here they all are. Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, Shintoism, Sokagaya, all of them. Protestantism, all of them bowing down, acknowledging the Pope. Now, didn't the Bible say that the whole world would wander after him? Yes or no? And that she would not suffer loss of children? Didn't the Bible say that? Judaism was there. All the religions were there. Now, this means that we are very, very close to the close of time. There's an interesting picture that was published once by the Spiegel, Der Spiegel, and here you have uh, a statue of Caesar uh, showing a finger. That's actually a Masonic thing, but never mind. There he does it. And they have Mussolini on the other side and giving the finger. And then they have Rome here, der Papst, die Kirche, die Sünde, the Pope, the Church and the Sin. And they have uh, the Pope over there in full sun worship regalia. And then they have the prostitute. It's almost like they know something, right? This prostitute, the Bible says, is the woman that rides the beast. The great prostitute that is over the nations. And all the kings of the world give their power unto the beast. We've seen that the ruling powers in the world actually come from very few families today. Highly occult families. And the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. Revelation 17, verse 8. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins, and that you receive not of her plagues. Revelation 18, verse 4. What do you think they have planned for those who harbor a spirit of separateness? What do you think they have planned for those who say, who say, like the Bible says, come out and be separate, that you receive not her plagues and that you don't take part in her sins? What do you think will be their conclusion about such a matter? I think this is a very, very serious issue. And we're going to have lectures on this. When we get there, we'll see what their final plans are and who they actually pinpoint as opposition. That would be interesting, don't you think? We'll let them speak for themselves. In the meantime, as for me and my house, I cannot join this ecumenical council, and I would like to uplift Jesus Christ to you tonight as the only Savior on this world, and follow the biblical way, and none will be lost. That is his promise. Why not take him at his word? Amen.